problem. Great. So we can we can start now. Okay. So you, sounds good. Okay. So I'll, I will talk in German. So That's cool. One, one two words about you, and um, then we can we can start your presentation. Ja, wunderschönen guten Abend, liebe Coaches. Um, we are starten an heutigen Samstag mit Coach Steve uh, Erksleben mit zu einer 3-4-Fire-Zone Blitz-Techniques in Path Clinic, in dem wir so ein bisschen nochmal über ein Defense-Thema sprechen werden, über sogenannte Fire-Zones, was genau das ist, wird uns Coach gleich erklären. Ähm, grundsätzlich ist er DC an, und auch Head Coach gewesen an verschiedenen High Schools, insbesondere im Staat Maryland, aktuell DC an der South River, River High School, äh, Edgewater in Maryland. Und ähm, Coach Erksleben wird, wie gesagt, jetzt über Zone Blitz Zone Blitzes sprechen. Grundsätzlich zu den Fragen, ähm, die bitte in Englisch einfach im Chat eintragen und ähm, Coach Erksleben wird sie dann am Ende seines, seines Vortrages beantworten. Das heißt also nicht zwischendurch warten oder sich wundern, warum wir nicht drauf eingehen. Ähm, wir hatten abgesprochen, dass wir die Fragen ganz am Ende beantworten. So Coach, without further ado, I will kick off to you and I'm excited to listen and learn to your talk. Me too. Can everybody, can everybody see this? Are we good? Yeah, we're good. We see Good. You. Perfect. Um, hey guys, thanks a lot for the, I really appreciate the opportunity to represent uh, obviously the United States of America and the state of Maryland. Um, my name is Steve Erksleben. I'm the defensive coordinator at South River High School. And it, it's in Edgewater, Maryland, which I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to give you a geography lesson, but it's about five minutes south of Annapolis, Maryland, which is our state capital, which is 30 minutes east of Washington, D.C. and about 40 minutes south of Baltimore. I've been coaching for 19 years um, in various um, – I coached a year in college. Uh, then I've – in the last 18, I've, called, I've coached in Arnold County, uh, Maryland. I've been a head coach, been a defensive coordinator for, for my entire 18 years at the, at the interscholastic level. Um, and, and like I was talking to Coach earlier about, you know, in those 18, 19 years, you go through a lot of uh, metamorphosis as a coach. You, you, you constantly adjust to the changing times. And defensively, we've got a lot to do. Um, and we have to take it to a level where we have to take – Well, we're trying to teach our kids and try to shrink it because uh, the old school, you know, reading guards and playing downhill and, you know, playing cover three, those things are, are not quite working anymore. So about five years ago, we decided to become more of a pressure defense. And um, since then, it, one, it's been a lot more fun to coach. And I think our kids have gotten a lot better because of it. So um, here are the three things I kind of want to talk about in the next hour. One, what's our base? I think they all kind of flow together. First off, what's our base defensive philosophy? You know, It's the why. Why do we do what we do? You know, that's going to be a very short thing about why we, you know, because I think when you're blitzing defense, I think it's, it's your identity. It's who you are. Um, then I'm going to talk, you know, in more depth about how we put those blitzes together. It's almost like a, a, a three pieces of a puzzle, and they fit together to create one base call. But, um, you know, there are techniques that we teach, I think, that are, are pretty unique. And, uh, and the goal is to get one guy free, um, at least. We want to get unblocked defenders to go make plays in the run game and also pressure the quarterback in the pass game. And finally, you know, how do those three blitz pass equal one defensive call? So I'm going to show you our three to four base blitz calls. It's unique, kind of uh, interesting now. We're in the process now in the United States, which we can't practice. We are doing the same thing we're doing right now, installing these blitz pads. We started that this past Monday. So um, hopefully it's fresh on our mind. Okay, so first and foremost, what do we want to be defensively? The first thing you want to be is simple. You know, I, the kids I coach, I'm sure, is the same way in Germany and other places in Europe. Uh, kids are playing multiple sports. You know, we don't have football only kids anymore. They're playing, you know, lacrosse in the spring, they're playing basketball in the fall, they're doing other things with club sports. So, you know, we're going to get them for about 12 weeks, maybe a little bit in spring, maybe a little bit in summer. But, you know, we want to try to make our scheme as simple as possible, you know. So we want to be as multiple and adjustable as possible as well because as the game goes through, um, we're going to have to do something in between series or in between halves to adjust to the, to the climate of the game. Um, we try, because we're an undersized front, because our kids are, 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 are multi-sport kids, uh, we want to, we think something in our back pocket, almost like a Swiss Army knife kind of thing is, is to appear unique or unconventional to the offense. Make them prepare for us. Um, I, I told our kids this past week in our Google Meet, I said, we're going to apply pressure, we're not going to feel it. All right, we want to put that back on the offense. For many, many years, the defense was the, the more reactionary part of the game. We want to try to flip that on the offense, and we're going to be the aggressor. Um, we also want to have the idea of the positionless. I got this actually from the NFL. Um, if, if, you know, the NFL is a big thing in our, in, our, in our country. And if you watch NFL football, um, 
you don't see a lot of base defense anymore. You see a lot of nickel and dime personnel, and you've got a lot more speed on the field. We're doing the same thing at the high school level. We're trying to get more speed on the field, and positions are not really based on a body type. You know, we don't need a, a 280-pound nose guard anymore. We need guys that can move, guys that can hunt the football and tackle. Uh, we want to have an appearance of chaos both pre and post snap. We're going to confuse the opponent, but not confuse ourselves. Um, obviously, your effort and sign of based, uh, but the culmination is let's create as many negative plays as possible. And I'm going to come back to that here in a little bit because you know, in a, in a typical high school football game in our in our league, it's about 120 to 130 plays. Um, is there a way we can win five to eight of those plays that are going to change the tempo of the game? Okay. Rationale, and I've had, you know, different discussions with coaches that I've been around in my career, and, you know, when you say you're a blitzing defense, they kind of give you a weird eye saying, we don't teach any technique then. Um, that's not true, and I think that's part of the, the, the lesson that we're going to learn, hopefully, today, is that there is some technique to, to the blitz game, but we came to kind of a wall a couple of years ago because we looked at our, our talent, we looked at our opponents, we looked at how we're going to win on defense, we said, like, okay, we got to win first and third down. we got to get them in second and long and get them off the field on third down. We're better when we blitz. We're just we're better. We get to, we 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 stop the run better. We pressure the pass better. We we pursue better. So it became well. If we're going to blitz on first and third down, then why not just blitz every play? Um, which sounds a little bit odd, but um, that became kind of our mantra. We're we're gonna we're gonna send fire zone every play. You know, it might be different calls. It might be from different fronts. It might be for you know uh, adjustments in the coverage. But in the end, five guys are coming. You just don't know where they're gonna come from. Okay, so what do we focus on to get that job done? First off, relentless pursuit. Um, we, we run pursuit every day. Uh, I'm fortunate enough, I'm the defensive coordinator. Uh, the head coach that I work with is the offensive coordinator. So we do have to do two separate practices going on. But I have run this same system at a small school. The last time I was a head coach, we had 21 players on the varsity football team. So we still ran the same system. Practice was organized a little bit different, but we always started with pursuit. And why is pursuit so important? Um, you know, in this, in, in how we do things, the ball takes some weird angles. You know, as we dent that offense and make the ball either spill or bounce, it's going to be directly headed to the sideline. Now we have to run the ball down. Um, a lot of times the blitz doesn't make the tackle. It affects the play, though. Um, so pursuit is a, is a big part of what we do, and I'm going to show you some things about that a little bit later. Uh, we do stress scoring defense. We don't really talk about yards given up or rushing yards or average yards. That's too much math for me, and it's too much math for our kids. But we do focus on how many points we're giving up. You know, two, two scores in a high school football game makes it a game. Three scores, now it's kind of in the, in the offense's favor. So uh, the last is more of a – I don't know how it's going on in Europe, but in the United States, it seems like the word analytics is used quite a bit when you watch college and pro football. Um, and one analytic piece of data that we like is what's called the rule of six. Um, and like I said, there's about 120 to 130 plays in a high school football game. Um, we want to try to – five to eight of those plays is going to dictate if you win or if you lose. So if we can cause a turnover or more, get some three and outs, and get some fourth down stops and equal six or more, generally speaking, we win. So we keep track of that. The guy, the, my coach in the booth, that's one of his main jobs is to keep track. How many turnovers do we have? How many three and outs have we, have we scored? And how many fourth down stops do we have? If it equals six or more, one, there's a reward for the team. But two, normally, normal times, we win. So we focus on those three things throughout the course of the game. We also circuit train our players. Most of our practice is a, is a circuit. It's not, you know, take the defensive line and go down there for half an hour. It's, you know, we are, we are working together, but everything is more or less a station. And we do that for a variety of reasons. One, because a lot of our players play multiple positions. Uh, this scheme kind of warrants that. Um, and two, it's a conditioner, really. We don't have to condition during, we don't condition after practice. Practice is a conditioner. You know, we focus on rugby tackling, what we call the difference period. Rugby tackling, you know, I'm sure the, the stuff from the Seattle Seahawks and the Atavis organization made it to Europe now. We're not fighting the football anymore. We're now near shoulder, near foot, taking the head out, you know, keeping our players safe. But in reality, it's a more efficient tackle. I don't know anything about rugby. I've watched it before on television. I've seen the movie Invictus. But those guys are perfect tacklers. We want to try to emulate that with our shorter pads and, and, and so forth. Um, and difference technique is, is a – we got that from Ohio State many, many years ago. Um, that is a focus on, you know, a lock out and a put in our pocket block destruction. So um, those all factor into blitzing, blitzing uh, uh, the offense. And I think it's something that we do on, a, on, a, on an everyday basis. Uh, we have established force and alley rules. Like I said, the ball is going to take some weird angles. Uh, we want to make sure there is one person at least with their outside arm and leg free, forcing the ball back inside to, to more players or using the, the sideline as, as a leverage point. 
okay, on a particular run, did the ball entry point change? If they're running ISO on the B gap and it goes, spills or winds back, that's our goal. If they're establishing a direct line through the defense, we have a serious problem. Uh, and finally, on a particular pass, did the quarterback have to hit shelf out or did his launch point change? If he gets to the top of his drop and the ball comes out, we're not, we're not affecting the quarterback whatsoever. And, you know, in our league and in, in, in our country, it's, it's more the three-by-one game and, you know, throwing those now seams and those, and those, those kind of dagger routes that can, can kind of slice the, uh, the coverage up. And we want to try to, once again, make that quarterback move. The longer he has the, hand, the ball in his pocket, the more it's going to probably be an incompletion. Okay, base alignment. Now, I'm not going to talk much about base defense because, you know, we generally don't really have one. We're, we're a blitzing front. But um, our base defense in general is a slanting one-gap odd front. We're, we're a 3-4 spacing. Uh, we play with less defensive linemen because we don't have very many defensive linemen. Um, now, virtually every snap, our interior defensive tackles and noses are going to line up in, a, in, a, in, a, in what we call a four-take. You get head up alignment on the offense tackle. I'm going to show you a picture in a second. We like the head up alignment really because – if I'm an offensive tackle, I come to the line of scrimmage and I see somebody head up on me, he has a two-way go. Generally speaking, in, in, in the way football is now, me as the offensive tackle, I'm not going to drive him off the ball. I'm going to take footwork to either try to reach him or scoop him or cut him off. So once again, he's got a two-way go, but so do I. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure, we believe, on the offense to try to have to cut a guy off or reach a guy. And generally speaking, we're not going straight up. We're either going inside or outside based upon the call. So from a base alignment standpoint, that's what we look at. That's what we look like pretty much every play before the ball is snapped. Obviously, we're going to slant the front one way and fit with an outside linebacker or vice versa and um, adjust with the coverage at bay. Okay, now we talk about split field coverage. We're also kind of a split front um, defense. So or our defensive line movement and forward are built to the front. So Right there in that parentheses where it says slant and angle, those are two separate fronts for us. So our, the first front we put in, day one of install, we call it slant. What that means is our Sam linebacker, which is our strong outside linebacker, he is the fourth rusher, okay? So our head-up alignment allows some deception because, once again, the defense alignment have a two-way go. Every snap we make a Roger and a Louie call. And I've had coaches tell me, well, aren't you telling the, the deep offense where you're coming from? They are, they've got enough to worry about. We want our guys to be able to communicate and understand where they're going. So we're going to focus on us and not so much the offense in this point. So, but the Roger Louis call is really establishing where is the fourth rusher or fifth rusher coming from, more or less which side of, we're more of an edge pressure team. We do some hold blitzing. We do some staggered blitzing. But, you know, for the sake of argument, we're only going to talk about edge pressure today. But um, that Roger Louis call is establishing where the pressure side is. All right. So, but, and the, the key, and this is where we sound a little bit odd, the key rule with our defensive line is, is if you hear Louie, so by our left, we're coming from the left, we are slamming right because we're fitting and creating that reduction um, inside. So if we were to split our front right down the middle, um, this is a Louie call in the situation, all right? So the left side of the defense is the reduction side because the tackle right here is playing the B gap or is becoming a four eye technique. The other side is the, what we call the non-pressure side. That is where a tackle has to play the, a five or has to be the crease player. The nose guard is becoming that front side A gap player. And now the linebacker is the B gap defender. So we can reverse with Roger, do, this, do the opposite thing. But, you know, as a basic rule, the defensive line always slants away from where we are pressuring from as it becomes a fit within the, uh, within the defense. Okay, so like I said, our base defensive calls at least on our base front. Slant is a is a is a strong side blitz side. Angle is a weak side blitz side. Now we're not limited to just doing that. We can also go two and away from the back. We use the field or the bench. Now when we install our defense day one, we are a, a field boundary team, which means that we call our strength in the field. We kind of build it off of that. But there are opponents that we have to, if we see some 21 or 22 personnel, we're going to have to call it to the tight end. If they are more of a three-by-one team, we're going to call it three-by-one. Um, but that is really based upon the opponent. But um, we start out with field and boundary, and we kind of work from there. But um, slant and angle is kind of the, the basis of what we're doing. We're slanting and fitting or doing the opposite. Okay, now, that's the basis of our communication system, how we're getting into a call. Now we want to try to identify, okay, what are those three pieces of the blitz that make up one blitz, blitz call. So in our blitz technique and terminology, we don't talk about blitz and gaps. We don't tell a linebacker, you're the A-gap defender. No, because the A-gap could open or close. Depends upon what the blocking scheme is. 
So instead, we use the blocking scheme against or in, in the pass section against the offense and prescribe three blitz pass with specific techniques based on what each lineman is doing or performing. You know, are they pulling? Are they down blocking? Are they zoning? Are they cutting off? It's depending on what the scheme is. Each of our blitz pass are coded in one word call. So I'm a, I'm a social studies teacher by trade. So all of our edge pressures are places on a map to start with letter T, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so, but inside those calls, there are three blitz paths that make up that call and every call is a little bit different. So, but to identify where each path fits, we look at the blocks of the center, guard, tackle, and to a certain tight end, and we identify as an aggressive block or a non-aggressive block. So if I'm an inside linebacker and the face mask comes to me, that's an aggressive block. If it goes away from me, it's non-aggressive. All right, so how we fit each of those is really dependent upon that. All right, so in every call we have, Roger and Louis, slant and angle, whatever it might be, we have the non-pressure side and the pressure side. So if you were, to, it's, it, since we are rocking the covers down, becoming almost like a one high team, now we have, it's, it's really becoming an eight man front. So to the left of this slide is what's happening in the, in the pressure. To the right is what's happening on the non-pressure side. So for the sake of argument, we're gonna focus on the pressure side for now. So the pressure is built, really built out of four different pieces. We have what's called an A-stick player, a B-stick player, a splatter player, and eventually whoever the force player is. And that's based upon the coverage. It could be we're, we're a one-high team by trait. We do play some quarters, um, but we're more of a ribbon Liz match team. So we're going to play most of our, our covers are a one-high fit. So we're going to have eight guys uh, affecting the run, and we're going to have somebody outside of the blitz as that primary force player. But what I'm going to do now is, is talk about what is the A-stick, B-stick, and splatter player? What does that mean? Okay, so... All right, the A stick. Yeah, so we're going to go kind of inside to out here. All right, the A stick would be what most would consider the A gap pressure, uh, blitzer, but we don't really call them that. We call it a cut the field player, which basically means it is the farthest inside part of the blitz. And the goal of the cut the field player is, is to get vertical penetration up the field based upon the release of the guard. So the goal is to get vertical two yards upfield and almost, I call it dense or kind of take that offense and just put a, a almost punch right through it and make that running back or quarterback fit off of that, that, that blunt force into the offense. Because we got other players outside, they're gonna fit off of that. So the key is to react either an aggressive block by the guard or a non-aggressive block by the guard and cut the field opposite of the guard. And I've heard about it, you know, you go, it's, they call it a butt side or face side. Um, you, know, you can use any terminology you want to. Okay, so we're gonna kind of break this into two different categories. How our defensive linemen, uh, approach a, 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 an A-stick and how our linebackers approach it because they are from different depths. So if a defensive lineman is A-sticking, you know, sometimes they call it the old uh, long stick technique. A little bit different how we do it, but it's, it's sort of the same goal. So when the ball is snapped, our, our left hand tackle is going to take a open step at 45 degrees and put his eyes on the guard. Um, the guard can do, once again, one, two, is aggressive or not aggressive. When it's an aggressive block, we're talking about face mask two or a pull. And if it is an aggressive block, we are teaching what's called a hands over technique. Why? The B gap in this illustration is getting smaller, the A gap's getting bigger. So therefore I wanna put myself in the bigger of the two gaps. So as that action comes to me, instead of engaging that guard and keeping that, that, uh, that A gap uh, open, I'm gonna get my, um, we use a, what's called an inside chop, outside chop, and a dip. And as that happens, bang, 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 we enter the A gap and try to cut the field opposite where the guard is moving. So got a couple clips from practice here to show you. Um, this is a half line blitz period. We do it once a day. Um, and we fit up with some of the, the top four or five um, run schemes we're gonna see uh, from an opponent each week. So we're gonna focus on the, our right, he was his left, left, he was tapped. He's gonna get a, a, an aggressive block from the guard. We're gonna watch him put his hands over and get in the A gap. So it's action two, you can see there's kind of a stutter there. And yes, are we playing a little bit horizontal in the line of scrimmage? Yes, but the ball is being designed to be spilled to the two guys off the edge right here um, who are once again unblocked. And, you know, not every person's gonna get free, that's fine. But like I said earlier, we're using the blocking scheme against the offense, okay? Now that's, that's aggressive. Now we'll talk about non-aggressive, it's very similar. All right, so now we're getting a pull away, a, a scoop or a down away, or possibly a, a second level charge by the guard. So if it's non aggressive to the tackle, it's very similar. We're still going to cut the field, but instead of hands over because now the B gap is remaining big and the A gap is getting smaller, we're going to try to, we use the uh, term, we're going to take the, take the air out. We're going to try to squeeze the hip of the, of the guard, then get up the field 
Um, so we physically feel for the guard, then cut the field. Now, a little bit different to the right there in the, in the second illustration. In some cases, you'll see schemes where the center blocks back, blocks in the backside of the gap on things like power or counter or something of that sort. Well, that is becoming an aggressive block to us because we have somebody into our face. So we're going to go ahead and do hands over the center when he blocks back. So center away, we feel for the hip of the guard. Center two, we go to the top of the center and get in that, now that new A gap. So here's a couple of examples. Um, we're getting the guard blocking down here. We're B sticking, I'm sorry, A sticking with the uh, tackle. And he looks to cut it close to his hip and get up the field. And like I said, I've got game tape of this too as well towards the end. But uh, like I said, it all really starts in practice for us. Okay. Now, our linebackers can also A stick. But because their alignment is a little bit different, um, their technique can change a little bit slighter because they are close to the core of the defense, but they're also one yard off. Now, we're not a blitz from depth team. We actually mug up or cheat up to give our kids a chance to read it and go. Um, but with the inside linebacker A sticking, instead of, you know, doing what the tackle did, we're going to take a stutter step. Why? To slow us down because we're so close. But two, it's the same reaction to the guard that the tackle had, aggressive versus not aggressive. So our stutter step is a stutter and a reload. So we're going to stutter and use that same outside foot to step through as we react to the, the path of the guard. Guard comes to me. I get my hands over, cut the field in the A gap. Guard goes away from me. I close to his hip, cut the field, eyes inside. Uh, but we're always going opposite of the guards. Here's a couple of examples. The first two are where the center blocks back. Okay, so inside linebacker is the A-stick player. His eyes are on the guard. Guard's going to pull. All right. Center blocks back. It goes from non-aggressive to aggressive because think about it. If he were to put himself right here, he's behind the play. That gap is closing because of the center's block. That ball's not going to wind back there. There's too much clutter. That, that back's going to keep it front side. So we're going to keep ourselves front side too. Like I said, I, the, the, the moral of the story is we're using the blocking scheme against the offense. We're not fitting so much in prescribed A gap, B gap, C gap landmarks. We're fitting it. We're fitting to, to grass. We're running the grass in, in a lot of ways. Open grass. Reading it almost like a running back. All right, same situation. There's your pull. Center blocks back. Hands over. We're kind of staying horizontal on the line of scrimmage, but we're going to put ourselves in the next available gap. All right, now this is not aggressive, no block back by the center. Idea is you want to stay as tight to the hip of the, of the guard. We have somebody outside too. He's called the spill player. We'll talk about that in a second. But your goal is to make that ball go outside of you or you make the tackle but it should not ever go inside of you. You must be as tight to the hip of your landmark. But in this situation, the guard is blocked down. The, the A gap is not existent. It's, it's, it's canceled itself out. We got a real big B gap there. And that's where we have to defend it with two players, pretty much. Okay, so that's the A stick, the inside part of the blitz. Next is the next outside move. That's called the B stick. Uh, this path is really designed to spill a play going towards us, or in some cases, chase down a play going away from us. And we have to make a decision in the run game. And we, in this last year in 2019, we were better as a chase team. So we want to try to set the blitz away from where the ball, we thought the ball was going. Sometimes we're better blitzing into it. Now we try to mix and match it, but um, you know, a lot of times we will chase stuff down from the backside, inside zone, outside zone, uh, the backside of power, backside of trap. Um, those, are, those are tackles for losses, so we'll take it. But the B6 goal is to fit outside of the cut the field player and inside the splatter approach is, is the force element. Um, but we are not, now we're, instead of reacting to the guard, this player is reacting to the tackle. Um, so with flow with the B6 player is purely a chase player down the heel line. Okay, so we'll start with the tackle first, okay? Just like the inside linebacker and the A stick, the tackle's got to take a, a stutter step on the B stick. Why? He's really close to the, he's lined up right in front of the tackle. We don't want to step at him. Now he's got, he's got, he's got a, a leverage and he's got an angle on us. We're going to step flat now and let, it, let us read his release. So, set us up for time. We teach the defense tackle to recoil. So, it's the same thing. We're going to step and use that same foot to either adjust to an aggressive block or come behind a non aggressive block. So, a face mask to defense alignment is an aggressive block. We think of zone, base, et cetera. So, because the B gap's getting bigger and the C gap's getting smaller, we want to fit in the B gap. We want to fit inside the tackle. 
with face mask away, it's a not aggressive block, we're thinking zone away, scoop away, counter, those kinds of things, or a tackle pull, we're gonna stutter, and, we're, and this is one thing, we're gonna feel for the hip of that tackle going away as we come underneath, and we'll look at that in a second. Okay, so it's better from the end zone shot, and this is a pass, so we're getting a protection where the back is going to block away, it's gonna become three on two with the tackle and the guard. Um, so, this is not a great example, but you'll watch this player right here. He does get his foot in the ground. The tackle's going to kind of, you know, block out or fan out, and that allows us to come back underneath because that's considered an aggressive block outside. So, stutter step, come underneath. He's got a direct line to the quarterback. Now, this, is a, this is a bad call on their part. But, you know, I've got a couple better examples here in a second in the run game. Um, okay, so that's aggressive. Not aggressive, kind of the same thing, except for we're going to stutter step, we get a pull or a zone away. Now, using the same foot, we're going to work to put our inside hand on the hip of the tackle and try to whip down the line of scrimmage. What we're trying to prevent is this. We're trying to prevent the tackle from getting up the field. We want to get down inside because we have another player just to the outside. If we were to get up the field, there's going to be a seam right inside that we can't defend. Okay, so this is flow away. And like I said, we'll talk about half-line blitz in a second. We, half of our calls in this drill are, are flow away. So we're working on blitz in the backside of a particular play. So the, the tackle here is going to block away. Now the tackle, our tackle is going to get his foot in the ground and come right down the line. Now in this rep, I, I wish he would feel it. his hand right here. He should physically put his hand on that tackle hip and use it as almost like a turnstile to whip down the line and put his inside hip on his butt. Now, this is not a, a tremendous rep. He's in the right place, but we, it's one thing we have to constantly work. Um, but we're working for, once again, he's now in a chase situation down the hill line. Okay, linebacker from depth, B-stick. All right, so once again, same situation. Linebackers are lined a little bit differently. He's, he's, he's in, he has some space. When we are a B-stick player as a linebacker, we're coming from depth. Now, we're talking like the All-American Blitz, that kind of stuff. So we're going to come from about four yards of depth. We're going to line up what we call a stack or a hip alignment over top of the tackle, and our eyes are on the tackle. And it's the same reaction as the defensive tackle. If I get an aggressive block, I'm going to come underneath and almost cut the field in that situation. If I get a, if I get a non-aggressive block, I'm going to come off the hip, use them as a turnstile, and come down the heel line. Now, I'm going to wait and show you uh, some game tape of this a little bit later um, of this particular technique, but it's virtually the same thing as a tackle. The only difference is the, the linebacker's coming from depth. All right, last part of the blitz as we kind of set them up. A stick's inside, B stick is the next one outside. The last part of the edge pressure is called the splatter play. Now, this is basically an old school box technique. What we call a box technique is I'm keeping out my outside of the leg free. I am more or less the blitz for contained play. Um, I'm the fellows outside. I'm pretty much the C gap um, defender. Um, and I'm keeping everything basically inside of me, but I'm also aggressively attacking it. Okay. Now, that's pretty simple when it comes to, you know, and, and I'm going to go back for a second because I forgot to mention. You know, I go back and forth with different coaches that are, that are one high teams, and they say, can this down safety here be the force player or not? Now, we've done it both ways. We've said yes, we've said no, really based upon the, the, uh, the coverage. If two is removed, it's really – the rule we're using now is, is that this down safety is a secondary force player. The, the sandbacker, the blitz for contained player, he is the primary force player. He's basically playing the five technique role. Now, that can change when number two is tight. He's the tight end. The coverage warrants the down safety now to be the force player. Now that, that outside linebacker who's the splatter player can almost be a second B-stick player. So it says, versus a tight end and 21 personnel, things change because the inverted safety is now close enough to be kind of into the run fit as a primary force defender. The splatter player safety is now compared to the B-stick player. So more or less, we're going to line up in a, in a nine. We're going to stutter step that as well. And once again, the tight end can only really do two things. He can try to reach me, or he can block down inside. So he blocks down inside. It's not aggressive. We come off his hip, put our hand up physically on his inside hip, and run down the heel line. He comes to me, get his hands over, cut the field in the C gap. So um, we're, we're more or less spilling everything to that down safety who was the force play. Now, if it's tight end trips, the rules stay consistent because we can rotate the coverage um, to that three-by-one and keep a three-man surface on their three-man surface. So here's uh, this is game tape. Uh, that's probably better from the from the end zone. 
We're going to watch number 10 here. This is against 21 personnel twins. We've rolled the corner up as the force player, so the outside linebacker number 10 knows that I can spill any block I want to. So his eyes are firmly through the tight end. Tight end's going to block out in almost like a man situation. He's going to try to work his hands over and cut the field down so you get. Because once again, 13 is the force player. He's right there. Now we end up making a tackle on the backfield, but if the ball spilled, which it is, we've got now one player outside who is now the force player who can box it and keep it inside and make the tackle. Okay. Now, some situation now we're going to get a non-aggressive block. And once again, it's better, it's better from the end zone. Okay, so inside zone away. Linebackers, the A-stick player, tackles the B-stick player, tight end blocks down. Good job feeling for the hip here. Inside backer makes the play first, but if it's spilled, we're there. And also with the way the coverage is designed, number two is the down safety is the force play because the tight end's tight. Tight end's removed or number two is removed. Now number 10 would be the primary force player and we play it, the coverage would change a little bit because of the space of the receivers. Okay, so how is this all taught? It's a lot of verbiage, it's a lot of stuff, and we major in it. You know, we don't minor in this stuff, we major in it. So it's our belief as a program that if you're going to major in zone pressure, you've got to find as many parts of practice every day throughout the course of your preseason, uh, training camp, regular season, and postseason to stress it. So it starts for us in summer install. A large portion of our, you know, in the United States, seven on seven seems to be taking over um, in the summers. Uh, and the first thing we do with seven on seven, we use it as a way to, to rep blitz coverage. We play a 303 deep primary coverage and we play it in seven on seven. Why? Because we're going to use to, we're going to put stress upon our back end to make sure they understand that we're playing a cheap coverage and they have to, under, they have to be able to adjust um, the premise of our coverage to, to take away from one person we're losing the blitz. Next is walkthrough time. Now, we're not a blitz on barrels team. What I mean is you set five trash cans out and you blitz on that. We blitz on moving people. We have to because our keys and reads are off of that. So, but uh, especially in training camp, we have a, a designated walkthrough time every day uh, before and after practice to work just calls and responsibilities. Um, our bag drills, we run the bags every day. You know, we're a high tempo, high energy kind of situation. And we start that high energy with bags every day. And that gives us a chance to work our hands over fence. You know, if you're going to expect something out of players, you better teach it. You better give them opportunities to practice it. Um, and the hands over things a little odd. We don't rip anything. Why? That exposes too much of my body to the block. I would rather hands over and dip, get his hands off of me. Think about this. Um, in the United States, I'm sure there's things in Europe, you're not seeing people block with their flippers anymore. You're seeing hands. So that means that I want to attack those hands, get my hands away from me, and now get, get off the field and go make a play. Um, obviously, pursuit is, is kind of uh, straightforward, except when we, we're in pursuit. We call a blitz call. We blitz in pursuit. You know, we get used to, I'm on the back and the blitz flow goes away. I put my foot in the ground and recalibrate and find the football. So just because the call has been made doesn't mean we don't still hunt the football. Uh, in terms of our, you know, techniques and our blitzing game, we have a blitz circuit. We, we don't, I don't tell the linebackers, coach, I coach the defensive backs. I don't tell our linebacker coaches, look, you need to work on these three pieces of the blitz. We're going to train as a group. And we're going to circuit train all situations, splatter, A stick, B stick, in a three-station three circuit at least once a week. And finally, our half-line blitz. That is the most important thing I think we do. We don't do a lot of inside run. We do blitz period instead because that's pretty much what it is. We do a blitz period versus the run. We also do a blitz period versus the pass. Um, uh, looking at their top four or five run calls, their top four or five pass protections. Um, and disclaimer, uh, individual time in our practice schedule is completely dedicated to the non-pressure shot. Everything else out of the side of individual is pretty much blitz period to us. So here's what our practice schedule looks like. We use Google Sheets. Um, it's good because we have a Google Drive and our coach can get on there and edit out their stuff. And I print out the final copy at school at the very beginning of practice. So it works out pretty good with that. But the arrows kind of point to the three big parts of teaching blitz. It's not just lining up the team and running it. It's actually working on those techniques and working on how all three paths fit together into one call. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a couple of clips of practice, things that we do, I think, because, you know, it, it's great to talk about the scheme, but when I listen to clinics, I want to, I want to hear the, the why and the how. How do I get this done? It's not just running stuff, drawing stuff on a whiteboard and then showing it to the kids. You, gotta, you have to be able to practice it. So the first thing is our bag agilities. Now, you're not going to be able to see it here, but what would happen in our bag agilities, this is, this is early in the season, 
we have two coaches at the top of these bags and they would present, you know, their arms or a, or a shield or something. And we're asking every player to go inside, outside, dip, inside, outside, dip, inside, outside, dip. Um, we run it as a group. I got this from Pete Carroll at the, when he was at, the, at USC. We run this drill every day. And it's, it operates as a conditioner. We do a focus on that plus two finish where you get across the bag and you burst for two yards to go finish a play. But, um, and once again, we try to film this looking for slackers, I'll be honest with you. Uh, same thing here. It's another, you know, a side, side shuffle. But at the very end, we go hands over, hands over, inside, outside, dip. Inside, outside, dip. We go both sides, right and left. Okay, next is our pursuit drill. And once again, we're going to blitz those barrels, and then we're going to take off. Rabbit takes off. It forces our BCR player to have to, we call BCR boot counter reverse, backside there. But also, it makes the people in the blitz. Ball gets bounced. Now we have to recalibrate. we got to put our foot in the ground and go find the football. Just because you're, you're an interior blitzer and the ball spills or bounces doesn't mean you're off. You're not, don't become a traitor. Pursuit of the football. And once again, we try to rep this – Every day, and we try to tape it as much as we possibly can. Lastly is our difference period. Once again, we might get stuck. We might get blocked. We want to get off of a block. We are a big difference, which means we want to try to roll our wrists and lock that blocker out. And if I have to, put them in my pocket to disengage opposite the ball carrier. So, you know, this is a once-a-week thing for us. We buzz our feet. We engage the blocker. We put them in our pocket, and we try to finish vertical. And once again, the finish vertical thing is cutting the field. It's, it's, a, it's a blitz technique but we're working it here as well. So I think the, the, the premise of this part of the presentation is, is find as many places in your practice to work blitz technique. And we try to as much as possible. Lastly is our blitz circuit down at the bottom here. So we've got, we, blitz, we split into three different parts here. We've got the front, we've got our inverted players, and we've got the corners. We're working on blitz coverage here, but in this core, we're working against live bodies. It's a non-contact drill, but we've got a scripted period where we're working the movement of the offense and the, and the reaction of the A-stick, B-stick, and splatter player off the guard, tackle, and tight end. So, like I said, different parts of practice to rep eyes and feet so we can apply to team later in, later in practice. Okay? Last part of this, everybody, is going to be now how we fit all three of these pressure or pieces of the pressure into one pressure call. So I'm going to show you our top four pressures. Um, and it kind of goes in importance based upon not only is it a run or a run pass situation, but also, you know, how successful we've been. And, you know, Tibet is our, is our number one pressure. It's also our simplest. It's our quickest hitting. Uh, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of confusion. It's just kind of downhill football. But in Tibet, now, like I said, I'm a geography guy. Um, we label all of our edge pressures. When I say edge, I'm talking outside linebacker, tackle, inside linebacker to the same side. We do have pressures that bring both outside linebackers. We have pressures that bring both inside linebackers. We have pressures that bring staggered pressure from one side and the other. But for the sake of argument, we're going to just focus on edge pressure today with the time we have remaining. Um, but in Tibet, once again, we, we, it's all word association for us. And, you know, all offenses in our country, they're, they're using one word to describe, you know, multiple positions. You know, like in a passing game, you know, I don't know, mesh or drive or, you know, flood. That means three things with one call. We're doing the same thing defensively. So we're taking our, our blitz calls, make them one work. Um, but they all have associations. So we use the letter T because we're telling the tackle where to go. And the interior letter is his assignment. So the B, B, B stick tells the tackle he is now a B stick player, which tells the Mike and the Sam to this pressure side, the Mike is now the A stick player and the Sam is the splatter player. Okay. The non-pressure side's over here. And the pressure side is here. We're usually playing some sort of one high coverage with this. We can play some quarters with it, but we have to kind of bash that coverage. So here's a couple clips of this. So it's, once again, it's better from the end zone. All right, so right here, there we go. Inside linebacker is the A-stick player. Tackles the B-stick player. Outside linebacker is the splatter player. So in this situation now, once again, the inside linebacker's job, and this is because he's the A-stick player, is to key the guard. He's looking for either a non-aggressive block, like a down block or a reach, or an aggressive block, a, a base or a zone. Now, we kind of go against the rules a little bit because, one, the guard's out of his stance pretty slow, but I would rather have him come behind this block, but he still was able to cut across, get in the A gap, make a play. But um, we would rather have him align more to the outside foot or with the big split. He went ahead and jumped it. I'm fine with that. But the idea is the A-stick player cuts the field. The B-stick player tries to spill or chase the ball, and the splatter player boxes the play. 
And once again, this is more, this is almost like a uh, um, fullback kind of dive situation here. It's, it's spill. And we've got three players for there too. All right, same situation here, 22 personnel. Fullback dive into the A gap. Better from the end zone. It's a better job by the inside linebacker there. The guard kind of comes out at him. He comes underneath. We've got now a face mask in the A gap, B gap. Splatter player becomes a C gap because we are, we're playing quarters over here, which means we're, we're playing more of a trap concept with the corner now trapping the flat, but also being the, the force player. So now the ball, if it is spilled, it's spilled to a free defender. Um, they try to punch it right there in the B gap. We've got three over two, ends up being a tackle for a minimal game. Okay, now number two is removed, two by two. Good job the inside linebacker here. It's on the back side of the play. It's one back power. Better from the end zone. Now, good job by the inside linebacker. We want him to be on the outside foot of the guard pre-stack. Why? It gives him a better chance to stutter and read that guard. If he's head up or inside, he kind of gets caught. So we're almost in a stack line here. We're trying to give him a little bit of freedom to line up where they want to a point. We're, you know, once again, we're not going to be able to come from depth and get there. So his eyes are on the guard. We're going to stutter step that. He pulls. We want to try to work to get as tight to the hip as possible. And also the center blocks back. If he doesn't, gets hands over and try to make a tackle in the, in, in the backfield. Okay. Gibbons tackle is, is right here because we get a, we get a non-aggressive block. He wants to work down the heel line. The splatter player should come a little harder here. But there's really nobody for the, for the A-stick player, which is the inside linebacker. All right, same opponent, same call. This is what we call Roger Tibet. So we're coming from the right. Better from the end zone. Same situation, inside backer's got his, got, his, got his eyes on the, on the guard. We get a non-aggressive block, we get a zone. Go opposite, face side, butt side. I don't know if they're gonna try to long trap him or what, but he's inside out of the block. It makes the ball cut back, you know? That play probably should be going somewhere, either in here or the hope that that, that gap gets bigger. It's, it's a little bit constricted. He's got to wind it back. The tempo of the play is slowed down. And that's the hopeful idea. Affect the, the, the ball entry point, which is where the ball is going to stick itself. All right, here's a pass. We're bringing boundary pressure. This is Louis Tibet. I'll say it's better from the end zone. So the right offensive tackle gets a set. He sets outside. That means the defensive tackle's got to come inside, going opposite. This is a pretty good job with his hands. You can see the hands are technique there. We want to go once again, inside, outside, and kind of dip. We don't want to rip because that's wasted movement. We want to be, and, I, and I usually attribute it to this. If you are a boxer, your hands are kind of constantly moving. We're the same switch. Our hands are never, our feet don't stop and our hands don't stop. Our hands are constantly moving, so there's no real. We're protecting our core, but also we're getting our hands down so we can run the hump up the field. Active hands. All right. Back to 20, 21 personnel here. Well, I try to give you some examples of both pass and run. I think this pressure is great against both. All right, so this is actually spread away. There's our splatter, our splatter player off the edge. He now gets into a chase situation. So better from the end zone. So this situation we're in Roger Tibet. Not bad by the inside back with the chop there. Want to keep running. Get to the out, get to some have. It's a turn back protection. So that means it's more of an aggressive block when you go inside of that. Decent job by the right tackle, constantly moving his hands and his head. 
because that really does allow the splatter player to come off the edge and be the free defender. All right, two by two. Rogers to bed, it's inside zone. Throwing end zone copy free on there, but we get we get zone away. Actually, the right, actually the left guard is not aggressive. He blocks out for whatever reason that frees the inside linebacker. And like I said, the nose sticks on nose sticks on the on the uh, center sticks on the nose, which is perfect. That means we got a two for one. But once again, it's not just blitzing a gap; it's eyes up in your stance and keying the man in front of you. All right, same call. Now on the back side of zone. Guard zones away, inside batter comes behind that. And you know, when it comes to where we want to call the blitz, I'm a we tend to call it to the back in both run and pass for the zone read element, but also in the protection, because now we're putting a defender on the back, and usually that's a win for us. So uh, we tend to want to try to blitz the back, not all the time, but we it's it's a it's a day one or first play of the game kind of installation for us. All right, here's an end zone shot of this one. Actually, no, cut off. All right, same call, Rogers to bet. Guard pulls, we get a guard blocking down front side. And once again, this guard here has got a tight split anyways. He blocks down. Inside linebacker here fits off of that. He's the A-stick player. He's the free defender. Once again, better from the end zone here. So it's Raj to bed here. And also, I, I'm not speaking on this, but, you know, especially on first and second down, we like to stem the front too, just to create some confusion. Going from a shade back to our base front. Now, inside linebacker's wrong here. I would rather him stay right there on the outside foot of the guard so we can see that non-aggressive block come down, fit off of that, and be the free defender. But splatter player's there, got to come a little harder. But he's also the box defender. Keeping your foot up, outside arm and leg free. Like I said, two zone read. All right, now we got blitz in or away from the back to the field. They let, they let, they let the, um, the B-stick player completely go. He's keen to tackle. Zone away. Not a bad job feeling for his hip. You can see his hand go right here for his hip. And now come down the line. You're an unblocked fellow. We've got linemen blocking nobody and people not blocking us. 71, the right tackle blocks nobody. Once again, use the blocking scheme against the offense. All right, next one, Texas. Now we're just taking, once again, the theme is, is we take those three blitz pass, we interchange them. So now we're just going to take two players and flip their responsibilities. Now the tackle is going to be the A-stick player, and the inside linebacker becomes the B-stick player. The outside backer stays as the, um, as the uh, splatter player. So just a couple clips of this, then we'll try to get some of the questions. Roger, Texas. Better from the end zone. So we've got the A-stick player as the tackle. He's now going to get his eye, 45 degree step, eyes on the guard. Inside backers, eyes on the tackle. And the splatter player's eyes on the wing, who we judge the tight end. He goes in motion, now we got an extra guy. Like to see the right tackle, who's the A-stick player, keep his shoulder pads down. You know, initial, the feet are good. He gets an aggressive block by the guard. But you can see just with that clip right there, we've got now the tackle clearing. Nobody's blocking the inside backer who's the beast at play. So it's a three on two. Um, front side, we've got the non-pressure side. There's a face mask in every gap. Um, there's really just nowhere to run because of the movement. All right, so this is Roger Texas to the bottom of the screen. 42 is the B-stick player can come a little bit tighter. I would I'd like to see him get his hands down and not get caught by the arm of the guard. 
They're trying to exchange, as we clear here, the guard and the center are trying to exchange our tackle on the inside linebacker. Hit this a little bit harder, dip your shoulder. He should not really be able to come off on that. But like I said, are we making the quarterback move in the pocket? That's a win for us. Now it becomes the pursuit drill. We would want, want the ball to get thrown right now. We want the ball to get thrown as late as possible. And the pressure makes the, makes the court have to evade. It's third, second, and long. It's a three- or four-yard game, but the same token, the ball's not getting thrown. All right, Roger Texas up top. We'll miss tackle here. Once again, it's better, better from the end zone copy, but we get the – I like to see the right tackle clear that guard. Hands over, clear the guard. We get an aggressive block right here. Clear, clear the guard, hands over, and get your butt in the A gap. Inside linebacker seeing the, the tackle block non-aggressive, come off the hip, field was hit. We should have two guys off the edge, which we do. That should be a tackle, though. Poor tackle. But in terms of scheme, we got two guys there. All right. Two more, guys. Two more. All right. This is probably, I'm going to show you a couple clips of these. Now, Tulsa is a reverse of Texas. Uh, it's the same scheme in terms of assignments, but instead of tackle going first and the backer going second, now the linebacker is going to go first quickly up the field, almost uh, cut the field in the B gap, and the tackle is going to come off his hip. This was our, I'll be honest with you, towards the middle of the end of the season, this is our number one short yardage pressure um, because of the reverse of the roles. And I think, once again, it's better from the end zone. So to the left of the screen, you're going to see the inside linebacker B stick now. Stutter step by the uh, tackle, and then A stick late, splatter off the edge by the outside linebacker. And what we're trying to get is we're trying to get a double on the linebacker. We're trying to get the tackle running free through that expanding A gap, and that's kind of what happens here. And now the back has got to kind of putter his feet and go horizontal. And once again, you're not going to score that way. And pursuit more or less comes to the, comes to the game. We want to fit as tight as we can to that. This is a sack right here. Pretty good job. So the inside back of the B-stick player is vertical up the field. We stutter step with the tackle, stutter step, and then feel for that guard and get your butt in the A-gap as it, as it expands. And it's a good change up if, you, if you've – Throwing Texas at him a couple times, it's a good change up. You're achieving the same results, but in a different path. Because with the slanting and moving we do up front, the best thing is, is the center locks on the nose guard. You know, better protecting teams will trade that off because if you think about it, the right guard's not blocking anyone. But the constant movement and confusion, once again, going back to the original kind of premise, you're using the offensive blocking scheme against them. And with the, the level of deception with two fours and a zero, you don't really know what it's going to come from. All right, this is Louis Tulsa at the top of the screen. And we missed on a sack here. He's got him dead to rights. What I also like is, and you can see it pre-snap, watch the running back. The running back is going to identify the, the mic – actually, a little bit farther back. Yeah, the running back identifies the mic linebacker right now, almost like a bogey. we got to block him, we got to block him, we got to block him, not knowing that we're going to reverse roles here in a second. So we're hopefully going to draw a double on the guard, which we do. Draw a double, and now the, line, the lineman can fit. So we've got, we actually have two free defenders here right now. Problem is, is the splatter player right here has fit inside the back instead of outside the back. And that's why this guy escapes. That should have been pushed to the splatter player 42, but he, he ducks inside. And like I said, I'm going to show you where we don't do it right as well. And they're not willing to do it right. All right, same opponent, same call. Much better job. Why? The outside linebacker fits outside the back. So now we get, we get the quarterback viced. He can't, 
He can't run out of the pocket. He can't really hitch up. Like I said, it's better from the end zone. And once again, we are kind of allowing the guard here of the, uh, the inside linebacker to almost be like the decoy. He's going to get doubled in that protection for whatever reason. Okay, last pressure to show you guys, 10 B. It's a lot like Tibet, only, once again, reversing of rules. So the Mike linebacker now is you're still going to be your A-stick player. The tackle is now going to become the splatter player. He's going to be doing what's called an echo technique, where it's hands over and now get up the field. And now the Sam linebacker, the outside linebacker, will be the, uh, the B-stick the B player. So there's a couple, couple clips of this. Now, I would rather us not show it like this. Um, you know, I'd rather have the outside linebacker here and kind of let this thing develop and come a little later instead of getting hip to hip with the inside linebacker. We're going to do a better job this season with coaching that up. Uh, it's one thing that, you know, doing our film study in the offseason, that's one thing we're not – we need to, we need to uh, adjust a little bit. But here, here it is from the end zone. So we've got the B-stick players, the outside linebacker, splatter players, a tackle, and now we've got the A-stick and B-stick player inside are both linebackers. They try to bring the center off on the linebacker late. We get a non-aggressive block by the guard, non-aggressive block by the tackle. So both inside and outside backers should get up the field. The ball is thrown off the back foot, which is good. It is completed though, but for, well, we get a penalty on that for a block uh, hitting the back. All right, same pressure. It's a better job here, better alignment. Good job by number 10 up the field. He affects the play. Now, in some cases with the back swinging, we may peel that. You know, this is third and, it's, it's third and five. We're, we were expecting run, I think, in this situation. So we're blitzing for the run. We would peel that depending upon the opponent. All right, same call. Flow away, sprint out. Now in a chase situation, it fits the same way. This is away from the back. Looks like the right guard, left guard and left tackle both vertically set, which is a non-aggressive block for us. We want to try to come underneath of that. Okay, so that's, that's all I've got for you guys. I'm going to take a look at these questions here in a second. Um, this is my contact information. There's both of my emails, as well as um, I'm on Twitter at Coach Erksleben. Um, I will send this, if you guys are on Huddle, I can send this to you uh, if you want to review it on your own time. I also have just the slides on uh, Google Slides, and I can send that to you as well. But I'm going to, I'm going to click on these questions and, uh, and see what we have um, chat wise. Okay, so we're just going to go kind of um, just, uh, so let's start with um, which blitzing technique do you coach the inside linebackers? I right, saw so hands over. What about club and rip, dip and rip, or chop and rip? Um, really, to be honest, the hands over is kind of a, a dip. It's not a rip. It's a chop and a lean. We don't want to get too much into ripping because as you rip up, I'm exposing that part of my body. I want to try to uh, what we teach is we want to try to take our shoulder pads and kind of, they used to call it get skinny for running backs. We'll do the same thing. We're going to try to get skinny and lean as we cut the field. So, you know, the rip takes time. The rip engages. If we don't have to engage a blocker, we're not going to. Um, and that's a little bit unorthodox. I get it. But, um, you know, the rip to me is too much. It's too much surface area for the blocker. He can reset his hands on you and use that against you. Uh, how do you coach time blitzes from depth? Um, what kind of preset keys to, to, to detect the snap? Violators, you teach your players. Okay, so great question. Um, first off, we time it. You know, when we watch film, we time, you know, we use a stopwatch and we time. Now, but in terms of pre-snap indicators, if they're in the shotgun, it really depends what they do. Um, a lot of teams in our league, they like to clap. So when they clap, that means the ball's coming. The other thing to think about is, is the center. If the center's head gets even, He's snapping the ball. Same with the quarterback. The quarterback's not going to look to the left or the right to take the snap. 
If his head's even, the ball's coming. So we usually key off the quarterback movement. If his head is even, we want to start showing something. In the shot, and under center, it's the same thing. Quarterback's not going to take the snap with his head over to one side or the other. When his head comes even, the, the ball's coming. So we're obviously not listening to the snap count. We're using the quarterback and to a certain extent the center as a, as a pre-snap indicator. We want to kind of show from depth. But like I said, we don't really come from depth um, from, as an inside linebacker. We're going to come from almost a one-yard depth and one yard outside the guard uh, most of the time. Okay, what kind of technique do you teach your free rushers who will get picked up by the, by the running back? Do they have a two-way go or a something you just use when attacking a running back? We're going to attack it the same way as a lineman, aggressive or non-aggressive. So if a running back comes to me and it's aggressive and I'm, a, I'm the A-stick player, I'm going to get my hands over dip him, um, um, uh, and cut the field on him. He's, just, he's the same. Just because he's a running back, he's still a block. So we treat them the same as a lineman in a lot of ways. If I'm the splatter player off the edge, I got to fit outside of him. Why? I got to keep my eyes on my leg for it. So we don't judge a running back any different than a lineman. We're still going to execute our same technique, whether it's a guard, center, tackle, whoever it may be who's, who's trying to block me based upon my assignment, A stick, B stick, and splat. Uh, let's see. Do you prefer to blitz away from the back because of the RPOs, make the quarterback handoff into pressure? Uh, yes. Um, depends upon, however, what is the run scheme in the RPO? Is it inside zone RPO? Is it outside zone or bash RPO? Um, because if you think about it, if it's inside zone RPO, he's got to throw to where the back is. He's not going to ride the inside zone, flip his hips, and throw the other way. Um, if it's outside zone, though, his vision is both – he can kind of go from number two to number two. Um, so – or really number three to number two. But, you know, we like the back, back blitzing on first down for a variety of reasons. RPO is one. Also, it's on regain. Uh, also, lastly – if you coached his own offense, I coached it myself before, you know, and I'm front there keeping the nose guard. So it means that our nose guard moves front side, the ball's got to cut back into the blitz. That's kind of what we want. So I would say, generally speaking, we like, uh, we like to, um, to use the back as our primary game. Okay. How do you play the three match covers with two rip and list players, two mod corners, one middle field for say, one middle hook player? What does that change your match three rules for, you know, under calls? or fast three. Um, the fast three's gotta be taken by the by hook player. Um, doesn't want to change much. To be honest, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to play it than spot drop. Um, I've got a separate presentation I can, I can send you on that, on the three match stuff. But we want to try to play outside leverage number two. Um, we're a scooch team, so we're gonna pop our feet and you know we're gonna try to get our, we're gonna carry two under, but we have him vertical and out uh, unless it's under five yards. So we kind of use almost like a quarters rule with that kind of stuff. Uh, when you stem the front, what are your rules for the timing? How late do you move the front? Um, we try to move as late as we can. Um, we do use a command from the linebacker. Um, we use a, a move right, move left kind of thing. Um, but that does take a little bit of practice. The front, we, we package our stemming front. Our stemming fronts are separate fronts. They're actually animal terms. We use shark, wolf, snake alligator, you know, and that means that we're going to line up in one front and stem to another, but those are pre-described ones. Um, it does take a little bit of verbiage, but we try to shrink it. Um, but the timing usually is off a call, and it's, you know, it's right before we start showing a blitz. What are your rules for timing of the coverage rotation? Because it is, it, if it is too early, it gives away the blitzing outside linebacker and a one high right. Um, yes and no. I used to be a real stickler for showing two and rolling the three. Um, but being more of a Rip and Liz match team now, you want to be able to match number two. So we do, I think any rotation, whether it's early or late, in some way, shape, or fashion, matches with the quarterback. Um, I, it's, it's really completely up to you, but um, we've given our players a little bit more of, a, of, a, um, of a, some leeway on it because in Rip and Liz match, our free safety is, 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 a, is a dead read player. He's not going to zone out. He's going to kind of pop his feet too because um, he can fit on the run as well. Because we do play press, it's, it's more like uh, I've been told that match, Rip and Liz match plays like cover one when he wanted to and plays like cover three when he wanted to. So um, how do you counter slow screen plays to the running back or tunnel screens to the receiver within your five-man pressures? That's how you defeat it. We're, we're, one, pursuit, you know, pursuing to the ball carrier. Uh, two, I think with Rip and Liz match, you are, you're playing outside leverage on any sort of screen. So 
it comes back inside, you're still sitting inside. But I'll be honest with you, that, that, is, that is what we see a lot of. We see a lot of screen. We don't see a lot of verticals. We don't see a lot of plays to, to the out. We, we see as teams start to have to adjust to us, uh, we see a lot of screens. The other thing is playing more quarters, playing different coverage, um, because you're not going to get there with the pressure. Um, if the running back swings, we do. We have started to peel that. Uh, I don't like to, but it becomes a four-man pressure. But if they're going to put five guys in, in, the, in the pattern, we've got to put seven guys in the pass fit. Um, that looks like all the questions. Um, anything else? Don't seem so, Coach, but you gave us an awesome presentation. I, I learned a lot, and I think I can, I personally can implement a lot of your your ba your information into into what we do. So we try to run the NCAA blitz, and but I never, but I never coached it that detailed like you did. And I think I can I can implement a lot from your presentation. So from my side, thank you very much for taking the time, and you really helped me. And I think all the other coaches um, to to develop the game over here. I, I mean, you know what, Scott? I think it's a meant. I, it's, it it give, it makes us. It puts. It takes the onus off of having ten thousand um, adjustments to uh, spacing and receivers and where the ball is. Now, I think it gives us more power defensively. Yeah, that's true. So. But uh, once again, I, I, I'm hopefully you got my kind of information. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to put it right. I think the best thing is. Here's my, here's my Twitter. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to contact me. That's great, Coach. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, I will definitely be, get back to you and ask you for the match, match coverage yeah. presentation you talked about and try to it's learn. Great stuff. It's, it's, I mean, we played, you played some true 303 deep, but – I mean, that the, and playing it from press alignment is even better. I, I was an old press quarters guy, when, you know, like, kind of like the Pat Narduzzi, Michigan State stuff, and we've kind of gone back to the one high stuff with being more of a zone pressure team, and it's just – it's great. It's like a Band-Aid that you put on anything. Yeah. And the offices hate it. The, and also the three-by-one adjustments are also – are are, are, are very – they let they give you leverage on every single receiver. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you're running skate? Yes, yeah, so three by ones. You will run. Yes, we run skate. We run uh, solo. We run. Um, we run kind of a bastardized solo too, which is I, I can show you that as well. We mm -hmm. have like four or five. It really okay. depends on and it depends on us. What's the space number two and number three? Mm -hmm. Okay, got gotcha. you. Know? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Because think about it in trips, who's going to get the ball the least? Number one strong. Yeah. So that's great. So, coach, I think. We, we don't have another question. And from my point of view, um, you did an awesome job presenting, present so, so much in, so much detailed infos. And yeah, from this time, I hope we can stay into co in contact. I wish Absolutely. you a nice day. And thank you for your presentation. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Don't hesitate to contact me. Yeah. Goodbye, coach. All right. See you, fellas. Bye.